From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hello. Dollar? You the Mr. Dollar that's been trying to phone me? Is this Dr. Bigby? That's exactly who it is, and I'm very busy right now. Look, Dr. Bigby, I want you to come out here just as soon as possible. It's the old Cronin Summer Place, about five miles up the river from where... Oh, I know where it is, I know. What are you doing up there? The house has been closed for years. Mrs. Cronin opened it up for a party this weekend, but she was taken ill on the train coming up, and I want... Is Dolly out there? Yes, she's the one I want you to look at. So she's back. After all these years, she's come back. She had a prescription from her doctor in New York, but she's taken the last of it. It's apparently her heart. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. I'm very busy tonight. Yo, what? Much too busy, and then there's a storm coming up, and I have a patient someplace, I think. Now, wait a second. If you're a friend of Dolly's, uh, Mrs. Cronin's, do one thing. Take her back to New York. Now. Tonight. Get her out of here. Fast. Before it's too late. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar at Wells Falls, New York, to the home office, Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Cronin matter. A half-million-dollar necklace. Expense account continued. Item seven, five dollars and forty cents, taxi. I figured I'd find Dr. Bigby in one of the local pubs, but I covered them all in about 30 minutes. No sale. And unfortunately, Bigby was the only doctor in Wells Falls. Worse, the local druggist couldn't fill Mrs. Cronin's prescription. The nearest chance was Tupper Lake, 25 miles away. Back out at the Cronin place, I turned the taxi over to Jason Prell, Mrs. Cronin's business advisor, and he took off for Tupper Lake to look for the medicine. Then I went looking for Mrs. Atherton, a village woman who had been housekeeping on the estate since the place was built. I found her in the kitchen. Storm's brewing up. It's coming out of the mountains. It'll hit us for morning. They always come in the night. I guess you've seen a lot of storms in these hills, Mrs. Atherton. Lived here all my life. Never been out of them. It's Miss Atherton, not Mrs. Oh. She's the Mrs. up in the bed. Even if she is a widow. Little Dolly. Mrs. Cronin, till death do us part. Did you know Barnaby Cronin, Miss Atherton? Yes, I knew him. Of course I knew him. I worked here. Oh, yes, you were here then. What kind of a man was he? Like any other man. Not according to Dolly, Mrs. Cronin. She apparently worshipped him. Still does, in fact. Dolly's always worshipping something. Everybody was always worshipping her. She had us all dancing to her tune and without even trying. You knew her back then? She was born and raised here in the village. I thought everybody knew that. No, that's what I missed. Well, we used to work together, waiting tables at the summer hotels around here. That's where Jason Prell saw her. Told her she ought to be on Broadway. She left the town the next week. Didn't come back again till after she and Barnaby was married. And she got him to spend a fortune to build this place for her. Well, I guess he had the fortune to spend. Oh, yes. She married well. Count on Dolly for that. Always got whatever she wanted and never even had to ask. Things were just given to her, always. Yeah, probably so. But she's been pretty generous herself. Like uh, keeping you on here, for instance, when the house has been closed up for years with nobody using it. Oh, she's the dancing darling, all right, right to the end. Well, now, if you'll excuse uh, me... There I... was something else I wanted to ask you, Miss Atherton. I'm not one to talk ordinarily, but you got me started. Well, this is not about Mrs. Cronin, at least not directly. She was taken ill on the train. I don't think it's serious, but I wanted a doctor to look her over. The only one in the village seems to be a man by the name of Bigby. Bigby? <laughs> he's the coroner here, but he's not a doctor. No? Oh, not anymore. Still calls himself one, but he lost his license ten years ago. He's a drunken sot. Yeah, I kind of figured. But he sobered up fast when I told him on the phone that the patient was Mrs. Cronin. He refused to come out, told me to get her away from here fast, and then he hung up on me. Forget him. He couldn't do her any good. But I'd, I'd like to know why he acted that way. Do you happen to know any reason? Bigby is a drunk. Who knows what his reasons are? I thought you might. Better ask him. What difference does it make anyway? He can't help her. 
Nobody can. What do you mean? She's come back finally. For the first time in all these years. Took sick on the train. That wasn't any surprise to her. She knew it was going to happen. Well, I guess she halfway knew. She knew. It's like with an animal. When it's hurt or sick and it comes home to die, and that's what she's done. She's come home to die. Oh, I think you're wrong there, Miss Atherton. I don't think she's anywhere near that sick. Barnaby didn't think so either when he came back here to die. Barnaby died here? Yes, in this very house. A heart attack, it was called. He came up on the afternoon train and... Hmm. That's strange. It was the same kind of night. A storm like tonight. Strange how things move in patterns. Were you here with him, Miss Atherton? Barnaby died alone. And the doctor? Bigby? Miss Atherton, was the doctor... Uh... I'm sorry, I was thinking. The bridges were washed out. Bigby didn't get here till the next morning. Wouldn't have mattered. He couldn't have done anything. Nobody could have. When it's time for a thing to be done, it's done. Nobody can stop it. Nobody. It was a strange year. Ominous and oppressive, with a feel of violence in the air. Even the house itself added to the feeling. Furnished lavishly in a style 30 years forgotten, it seemed garish now, old and tired and lonesome. Like Mrs. Cronin herself, who'd planned a grand party for all her old friends and instead lay ill and alone in the bedroom upstairs. The queen gave a party and nobody came. All dressed up, no place to go. Yeah, gloomy evening. Jason Prell came back from Tupper Lake with a medicine. Miss Atherton served a dinner of sorts, served it in silence, and we were left to our own devices. Five guests and a mansion built for a hundred. Prell stayed pretty much to himself. Lovely Laura Dean, with that air of knowing innocence, and Vigil to Shorty Weber into teaching her some of his old dance routines. And they cranked up an old phonograph in the music room. And me, I just stood at an open window and watched the rain come down and tried to think. That's the perfect touch. It's exactly what the evening needed. That music? Ah, Sylvia. Really cornball, isn't it? <laughs> no, no, Johnny. I, I meant the thunderstorm. An isolated old mansion. Fabulous necklace of diamonds and emeralds. A weird housekeeper. A hostess lying ill. And now rain. Shades of a house of usher. That'll make a good lead for your magazine story. I should have stayed in New York and just written it, not lived it. Oh, I thought you were the big take-a-chance girl, Miss Blake. Danger, mystery, adventure. Don't those things appeal to you? Maybe. Is there any of that lying around somewhere? There may be, before the night's over. Well, all I can see at the moment is sheer boredom. You have to know where to look. In the bottom of that scotch glass, for instance? Oh, <laughs> just killing time. Oh. Uh, I've been wanting to uh, ask you, Johnny... How'd you get that cut on your head? Uh, it's a long story. It happened on the train, I know that. You didn't have it when we left. A sudden stop. I fell over my suitcase. Sure you did. Backwards. Huh? It's on the back of your head. Somebody made a try for it, didn't they? On the train coming up. Well, I don't know what they were trying for. It wasn't time to ask. Maybe they even got it. That's the way you were betting, wasn't it? That it wouldn't be just an attempt. That somebody was going to get it and get away with it. Did they? Is that what happened? Is it gone? All right, just stand there and grin, then. Oh, rain. I'm going back to the city tomorrow. You are? Well, don't smother me with your pleading. <laughs> no, stick around, Sylvia. Things may get better, including the music. You know, in a way, I hope somebody did get the circle of fire. Why? What good is that fabulous necklace doing her now, lying up there? She's had everything she ever wanted. Life's been too easy on her. She doesn't deserve it. She ought to lose it. Her life or the necklace? The necklace, of course. You know, for reasons I can't go into, I think you'll be sorry you said that someday. Sorry? Why? She's a woman who's had everything. You're pretty bitter, aren't you? Hurt and afraid. Am I? You feel something big may have passed you by, and you put up that tight, bright front for protection... 
But inside, you're tied in knots. And what is your recommendation, Doctor? A man, perhaps? That's the usual advice. Now, you said it. I didn't. Well, you're a man, Johnny. Why don't you smooch with me? It'd be a way of passing the evening, killing time. All right. What are you... Johnny, wait! <sighs> Johnny. What? Why did you do it? Because you wanted me to, I... and because I wanted to. Adventure? Mystery? Danger. Who's bored? Who's going back to the city? Those doctors are right. Mr. Dollar, could I talk to you for a minute? Why not, Shorty? What's on your mind? I don't know exactly why you call us all together and It was Mrs. Cronin's idea. She set it up with me earlier. Well, it ain't got nothing to do with what I want to say. You you, you seen me in a bad light there yesterday at Dolly's apartment. Well... Well, you found a gun in me. You know about my record. It made it look bad. I, I know it did. But say, help me, Mr. Dollar. Everything I told you was the gospel truth. Yeah. I'd break my arm before I'd do anything to harm Dolly in the least bit. You see... I've been in love with that woman for 35 years. I'd like to broke my heart when she married Barnaby. But I always knew I didn't have no chance right from the start. She was up there, big, somebody. Me, I was a nobody. But I'd still die for her any time. That's all, Mr. Dollar. I just wanted you to know. They were all there, gathered around the big dining table, watching me and waiting. Mrs. Cronin had asked me to arrange it. She said that was the main reason they'd come, and she didn't want to disappoint them. I told them that. And then I took the circle of fire from my pocket and laid it on the table. They all reacted in different ways. Laura Dean gave a gasp, and her eyes opened wide. And Sylvia... Look at it. Just look at it. Sylvia Blake was fascinated, hypnotized. Yeah, you should have seen it on her back in the old days. It sparkled even twice as much. Hmm. So that's what this is all about. It's only jewelry. I've seen it before. But there was one special reaction I was looking for, and I got it. Jason Prell's face went white. Who could imagine anything so beautiful? Mr. Prell, you seem surprised. I wasn't carrying the necklace in its case, the case you stole from me on the train. I was carrying it loose in my pocket. What did you do? Throw the case off the train without even bothering to... It's running away! Prell! I went after him, but he'd already disappeared somewhere down the hall. He knew the layout of the house, and I didn't. I searched the different rooms quickly as I passed, but there was no sign of him. He couldn't have reached the floors above, but he might have gone down toward the game room and lower halls. I eased my gun from its holster and started slowly down the stairs. And at that moment, every light in the house went out. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Cronin matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a white lie, a bullet from the darkness, and death comes in out of the rain. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking.